coming up on The Perspective with Mike Sherboneau and Julie Stoutland. The life and legacy of St. Teresa lives on in the people she gave her life to. And now a new documentary filmed in different locations around the world shows how the merciful love of God lived through this modern day saint. Where does this love begin? In our own family. Although she didn't have birth family of her own, Mother Teresa, known in the Roman Catholic Church as St. Teresa of Calcutta, was an Albanian Indian who left her own family to give her life to the work of Jesus, where everyone became her family. Mother Teresa, no greater love beyond the vision is a masterpiece of biography created by producer David Nalieri, who released the film to critical acclaim. Today, Mike and Julie delve into the life and times of Mother Teresa, a saint who lived and worked much like Jesus for her entire life. Only for the benefit and love of others, she shunned the limelight, but celebrities, religious leaders, politicians, educators, and millions of others followed her everywhere. Now the documentary is allowing new generations to remember this true hero of Christendom. Well, no doubt about it, Mother Teresa is known to millions and her impact yeah. is just simply huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Julie, I'm excited as we're going through this week on The Perspective to be able to talk about the power of the tongue. Uh, Mother Teresa spoke life and hope into so many she people's sure lives. Did. becomes a sterling example. How about you? And we think about the tongue. We talked yesterday a little bit about it. Any, what, what, what about me? I'm getting caught underneath the whip, collar. Or we got the zipper on. <laughs> oh, you know, I wish I could say I was always perfect with my words, but it's something we always need to work on throughout life. You know, there's one of those statements that says, sticks and stones mm -hmm. can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And what a lie. Yeah. You know what I say to that? <laughs> Exactly. You know, actually, I, I was planning to do that just to see your reaction. Just wanted to set it's you up. perfect. But, you know, many times your words, as I said yesterday, invite people to live or die. Have you thought a little bit about it since yesterday's show? I hope so, because what an opportunity we have to impact people, to change the climate in your home. And, uh, Julie, our, it's like our tongue is almost like um, the thermostat. It can set it yeah. to hot, cold. Yeah. I know. It's, it can be nasty and it can be fabulous. We got an amazing guest we today. We do. We absolutely do. Producer, Mother... tell us about who this amazing guy is. I want to say his name because oh, oh. people can't say my name properly, but I have nailed his name and it's <laughs> David Naylor Airy. And uh, we're so excited he's here. Tell he us really about are. David. Well, well, let's first say that Mother Tree, uh, Teresa is known to millions around the world, but it's it's hard to believe for many of us she joined heaven way back in 1997. And thanks to a documentary film uh, about her, younger generations are going to get a chance to learn about this wonderful, amazing saint. And David Nailieri has been a part of that, the producer of an incredible documentary on the life and times of Mother Teresa. No greater love. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for being with you, and uh, great job with the pronunciation. I, I grew up saying the G is silent, the G is silent so many times it became re repetition, but uh, we nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't see, ask you if you could pronounce my name, and we won't even go there because that's not important <laughs> today. Yeah. <laughs> David, why Mother Teresa? What inspired you to produce this film? Well, I've been very privileged, uh, Mike, to work for the past decade for the Knights of Columbus. We're based in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, the Knights of Columbus has a very long history um, of collaboration with Mother Teresa when she was living and in her order, the Missionaries of Charity. It's a very close relationship. The Knights of Columbus were founded on the principle of charity. And of course, we know that's what Mother Teresa was all about. Um, and when Mother Teresa died in 1997, in those ensuing years, the Missionaries of Charity wanted to tell her story to a new generation. They wanted to kind of make a definitive film on her life. And they explored Hollywood, uh, feature films with actresses, and they couldn't find the right script, couldn't find uh, who could play Mother Teresa, and, and nothing ever became of it. And then a few years ago, they saw another documentary I had made on John Paul II, that they really liked it. And they said, well, maybe the Knights of Columbus and David Alieri would want to make this film. And those conversations started about a year ago. And I'm very grateful to the to Patrick Kelly, the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, um, who decided to greenlight the film September of 2021, uh, which was challenging because we wanted to have the film done in time for the 25th anniversary of her death, which was in September of this year. And so we raced uh, 
fought through the COVID uh, restrictions that were in place in certain countries. We filmed on all five continents, did more than 150 interviews. And the result is this uh, feature documentary, uh, Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, which was really a labor of love for our entire team here at the Knights of Columbus. And uh, we just we yeah. feel very privileged to tell new, her story to a new generation. Well, yeah, and I want to talk about that, David, the fact that you visited five continents to film this documentary and that the entire project was shot and finished in just one year is simply a miracle. And and as a co-owner of our own media production company, I understand all the logistics that have to come in place in order for that to happen. And we're going to hurry to get through the show. I know. So you you (laughs) could tell us even more about that, about organizing and like all the planning, the people involved. Uh, Did you have like, you know, visas and and permission and... Right, right. No, it was it was challenging. I mean, typically when I make a documentary, I like to have like one camera guy who's kind of the visionary and he's traveling everywhere. That was impossible because we were trying to film it in Mexico and Brazil and Korea pretty much at the same time. So we had to use multiple crews. So that gets involved in complications. And then, you know, every time you're booking a flight, you're spending hours researching the COVID restrictions in place for that country. And so that just added a whole other layer. And then you have to deal with, okay, what are the health restrictions? Do, do, do you have to have vaccinations? Do you have to wear masks? So it just made everything much more complicated. But I think we were just all in. We were all in on this project. It was very exciting. Um, and we realized, we realized we were doing something very, very special because the missionaries of charity, they're not publicity seekers. Um, so they typically do not allow phot- photographers, journalists, cameramen into their apostolates. So to be able to kind of go in and be in the favelas in Brazil and watch them as a minister to the poorest of the poor or with refugees in Tijuana, Mexico, or with severely disabled children in Nairobi, Kenya, just gripping images that really, I think, make this film so powerful. We knew we were dealing with something very, very special and an extraordinary opportunity. And I think that inspired us to put in those extra hours to go the extra mile uh, to make this film, uh, I think, the success that it turned out. Oh, yeah. And I think the fact that you, when you are filming something like this, it's very delicate with the children, with the people that you want to honor, you want to respect, and you bring dignity to. So obviously, there's a lot to work through that, and you've done a fabulous job. You know, David, um, one of the things that I've experienced personally and that's impacted me for years was when I was preaching through the country of India, uh, I went to see Mother Teresa. She wasn't there, unfortunately, that day. But I did visit uh, the the home for the dying and saw the the amazing work of the sisters, what they were doing there. And it has had an impact. And I have a number of quotes about Mother Teresa that I've just just have been embedded in my mind. What has impacted you? Is there one or two things that have just stood out for you personally uh, as you pull together this amazing documentary? Yeah, I think so many things, you know, I, I going into the project, I knew about Mother Teresa on kind of a, a basic level. I could tell you some basic elements of biography, obviously one of the most famous women in history, but I never read a full biography of her. There's a lot I didn't know. So, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of insights that deeply impacted me. But a couple I'll say is like, you know, some people say Mother Teresa was not a radical even though she lived an incredibly radical life, right? So a radical comes to you and says, this is what I do. This is how I live my life. Now you go and you do what I do. This is the way to do it. Um, But she didn't really do that. She felt this call from Jesus. She heard the voice of Jesus that she was called to go to serve the poorest of the poor, to go into the darkest holes of the world, um, to encounter these people. So for her, she was seeing Jesus and everybody she encountered. Now, in order to encounter the poorest of the poor, she would go into these places that nobody would go. Uh, and, and, and that's how she encountered the poorest and did the incredible work she did. And she wasn't saying that we have to all go do that. What she was saying is that the people you encounter in your everyday lives, whether they're your work colleagues, your family members, uh, people you encounter, whatever activities you're engaged in, those people represent Jesus. Those people have an inherent dignity and, and seek to love Jesus in them. And that's a very powerful reminder to all of us to live our Christian walk in a more powerful, more authentic way. And that's why I think she's very much a saint for our times. So that was one thing that, you know, really struck struck me and um, humbled me and maybe want to want to live uh, my faith in a more uh, authentic way. Mm. Um, I think, um, and one other thing I'll say too is Mother Teresa, just her courage. This was a very, very courageous woman. Um, and she balanced her courage with also love and mercy. So when she encountered people, there was no sense of judgment. Mm. And there was that love and mercy that allowed them to want to accept Jesus, to, to change their life. 
But she could also be very courageous. And in the film, we show her 1979 when she receives the Nobel Peace Prize and she's with all the global leaders of the world. And everybody's shocked when she makes the focus of her speech on abortion. And she called abortion the greatest destroyer of peace in the world today. And so that was what she was willing to do, willing to speak truth to power, but also show the love and the mercy of Christ in her individual uh, relationships with people. And I think that's what we as Catholics, as Christians can all strive to do. I think that's a wonderful example of how it is possible to have this balance of standing for something, for what you believe in, and still show love without judgment. And she's a wonderful example for all of us. And I mean, that's why we, we really need this documentary. But listen, we have so much to touch on. We, we're going to have to take a quick break. So stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. When she smiled with the lines in her face, it was almost like an exclamation mark of joy. For Mother Teresa, there were no expendable people. Everyone has dignity and worth because everyone is made Well, we're talking today about Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, the documentary. And, and David, I wanted to ask you this. I've heard that she said she had a call within a call, and I'd really like you to explain that to us. What did she mean by that? Yeah, because she had become a Loretto sister. So she was a nun. She was working in India, spent almost two decades there before she founded the Missionaries of Charity. So that was her first call, this vocation to give her life to Jesus as a, as a Catholic sister, a religious uh, but then she, in September 10th, 1946, she was on a train. And while on the train, she heard the voice of Jesus. Mm. And he called her to go and serve the poorest of the poor, to leave the Loretto sisters and to start her own uh, her own religious order, which became, of course, the Missionaries of Charity. And during that period, 1946-47, she would continue to hear the voice of Jesus. Um, she wrote many of this down. And his call was to come be my light. Will thou refuse? go and serve the poorest of the poor. And she would write down these messages. She talked to her confessor. These were, she wanted eventually these all to be burned, but they saved them. And uh, we have this, even we explored a little bit more in the documentary. But um, yeah, this call was an audible call from Jesus that was beyond her original call to become a sister. And that's why we say a call within a call to serve the poorest of the poor. Mm. You know, David, as you talk about the call that she had, it impacted her life significantly. Yeah. And in the first interview that we did with you a few minutes ago, you mentioned a phrase, and I've been mulling it over, says, Mother uh, Teresa was known for having a complete lack of judgment. You got to unpack that statement for us. Yeah, so when, I, when you say complete lack of judgment, you, you, we're not implying that she did not believe in the reality of sin. Or, or in the reality that we can err in our life that needs course correction. It's just that when she was sitting down with somebody who was a prisoner, or maybe somebody who was a crack addicted mother in, in a home, when she was with them, she was giving them a sense of their dignity, a sense that they were loved child of God. And that's all they felt. When they're with her, they didn't feel like they were being judged because of mistakes they made in the past. She made people feel as though you're not the sum of your weaknesses, that you're not the sum of your failures, you are the sum of God's love for you and your ability to be redeemed because of Jesus Christ and the bloodshed on the cross. And that came across, I think, in such a powerful way. And in our film, we have several testimonials. One is Jim Wahlberg, the older brother, of course, the famous Mark Wahlberg, who encountered her in a prison. He was doing a nine-year prison sentence, changed his life. And another woman who was a crack-addicted mother um, who completely transformed her life after that encounter. And so th that's how I would explain the lack of judgment. I love how you worded the sum of God's love instead of of your errors. That, that what what an encouraging, strong statement that is. That is. And I can't imagine doing this this documentary without being impacted. So I want to ask you, what did you learn about yourself while filming Saint Teresa's documentary? Well, just I think more and more the reliance on prayer. I think, uh, and uh, you know, going into it, there was moments where it didn't know if we would possibly hit this deadline. Uh, there, you <laughs> I know, can imagine it, 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 that. Yeah, it seemed very, very daunting. Um, by the same token, and then you, you have to kind of fight through sometimes negative feedback. So in the process, I was thinking, okay, where can we place this film? And, 
And we wanted to get as big a reach as possible. And so we we had doubts, you know, in terms of the culture. Will people embrace a faith-based film? Could we find a way to reach a wide audience and not be kind of boxed in because Mother Teresa did talk about challenging subjects like abortion and others yeah. that maybe some people don't want to hear about. So, you know, you have to fight through all that. And how do you how do you deal with that? And, and we turn to prayer and we turn to reflection and just re- being kind of um, convinced in our conviction to make this film in the right way. Um, and I think and I think the process, it's kind of lifting weights. You lift and get stronger and stronger. And then doing a project like this made me, made me a better filmmaker for sure because I've never done anything on this scale before. Yeah. And I think it made me a better man because I just, you know, when, you're, when you're spending so much time listening and reading Mother Teresa, mm. you're soaking in uh, lessons, life lessons from one of the great lives lived in history, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, David, um, I remember a powerful story that's impacted me. One day, Mother Teresa was here in the States uh, in Washington, D.C., and she went to the Anacosa section, which is on the other side. And you can see the White House and stuff like that. But the Anacosa section is a, it's a ghetto of drug, uh, homelessness and crime. And as she was climbing the red brick stairs of the Church of the Assumption, uh, a newscaster, as only they can, stuck a mic in her face and said, Mother Teresa, what do you hope to accomplish mm-hmm. by coming to the Anacosa section? Never forget her response. She said, the joy of loving and being loved. Mm. And how did you capture that? Maybe it was an easy thing, but you would have so much to choose from as she poured love into people's lives. How did you make those decisions? Yeah, that was one of the most challenging aspects. Like, like I mentioned, we, we did up more than 150 interviews. We have about 300, 400 hours of footage of that we filmed at all these different apostolates. And then we, uh, beyond that, we, we did is every single country she traveled to, we would contact the main TV stations that covered it. And we gathered in a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, B-roll of her different travels. So we kind of sat down with a tremendous amount of footage. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I think a lot of it is the Holy Spirit. You pray for guidance, you pray for wisdom, making those decisions. Um, I'm blessed to have a tremendous editor who's very much uh, joined with me on the creative you know, aspects of this. Mark Boudignon, who's actually in Ontario, is in Oshawa. Um, and he had a little relic of Mother Teresa on his desk. And uh, we we're asking for her help from up above. But um, but I think what we wanted to do in this film was to hear from Mother Teresa. So throughout the film, we hear quotes from her, from speeches, from talks. So you can kind of get a sense of her personality. And she had this, even though she had a heavy accent, she was a very articulate, very brilliant woman. And um, she was known for these these short, pithy phrases that really hit home. And I think that comes through in the film. Um, and then we wanted to show that her she had a continuing legacy, that her legacy lives on. And so when all the different apostles we filmed that, where we see the ongoing work of the missionaries of charity, that, that shows who they are and what Mother Teresa aimed to live. Because I think when you see some of the footage in this film, uh, for example, feeding a little hydrocephalus baby with these big swollen heads in, in Kenya, just the love and the tender care, you know that for the missionaries of charity, that's Jesus. Mm. And uh, I think the gospel comes across in that way very powerfully and shows you who Mother Teresa was. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, we're running out of time, so I want you to tell our viewers, when is it coming out? Where is it? Tell us, give us a spiel on how we can see this wonderful documentary. Sure. So we had a theatrical release early October across the United States has done very, very well with Fathom Events. I just learned today, actually, we're the number one documentary for the year with Fathom Events and number two overall across North America. So the film has grossed more than $1.6 million and uh, we're enthused. All proceeds for the nights are going to go back to the missionaries of charity to support their work. Uh, We had a limited theatrical release in Canada um, early. Earlier in uh, this month of November, we're hoping to come back in Canada for a release in Quebec in December. Uh, We're hoping possibly for another theatrical release in Canada in January. Um, And we will eventually have it streaming on the main platforms and DVDs will be for for sale. That's coming in the very near future. So all information on where you can watch it, how you can watch it. We're going to post updates on our film's website, which is MotherTeresaMovie.com. That's MotherTeresaMovie.com. So for all your Canadian viewers We're trying to find a way to get it to you. We will get it to you. And the updates will be on our website. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, David. It's been wonderful to speak with you today and wish you all the best. Thank Thank you for this opportunity. Appreciate it. God bless. All right. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. I want to take this moment to tell you why we do the perspective. And Julie, there are two words going through my mind. (laughs) I know what they are. What are they? 
hope and help. You got it. You knocked it out of the park. <laughs> hope and help are so important. And can I just share with you as the viewing audience that we want people to experience the hope that happens when they put their trust in Jesus. I know it transformed my life. It will transform yours if it hasn't already. We also want to help people and through the many interviews and as we teach God's Word, to help people to realize that the Lord is with us, that He is our refuge and strength. So could I ask you to help me give hope to people across our country? Why not go to the link below and donate to support the perspective and together we can give hope and help to our country. Most people know who Mother Teresa is, but I think this documentary is really going to give a wonderful insight into how she lived out her life and the greater impact. When you, when you find out they've been on five continents and how it's expanded, and I think it's going to be really eye-opening uh, for people to see what kind of a woman she was and how steadfast she was in her faith. I know myself how up and down and I get overwhelmed by, by, by things that are sad and that, and yet she has such a steady resolve that I'm going to press through no matter the sadness, the, the, the misery, and I'm going to give the love of Jesus. You're going to keep pressing on. And she was a powerful mentor. Yeah. And we need mentors like that, people really who do. are examples. You know, Julie, yesterday I was sharing something uh, about a story that takes part in the church that I pastor, and this is the North End Church Food Bank. Mm -hmm. It says, I think Mother Teresa would like this, everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible in Jesus. Yes. And through COVID, you know, it's just a brand new church, but we embarked on this uh, food bank, and yeah. people stepped up. There's about 50 volunteers that run it every week. They That's deliver great. food to people, and they said, hey, let's give these people Christmas. Amazing Christmas dinner, and for the first 500, maybe more are going to register, and we're going to give beautiful gifts to everybody, mm. and to children, and, uh, and for the parents. And you know, one of the things that's been happening in the last week since this happened, and I want to invite you as our listeners, if you want to participate, you can go to northendchurch.ca, and you can donate to the food bank. And the food bank is going to provide this amazing outreach, but large retailers, Businesses, it's one like, business says, we're bringing our staff and we're paying them to work because we need about 130, 40 volunteers to pull this off. You get to pick a present, then there's a wrap, there's 30 wrappers or something. And I don't mean like wrappers <laughs> like that. You know, they're going to wrap the present. They don't want me wrapping the no, presents, man. No. It's just like a big snowball. <laughs> and we don't want to do that. It's going to be a special time yeah. for some of the people in St. Catharines. So if you'd like to support it, you can go to northendchurch.ca. It's a neat story. People are catching the spirit of generosity. And we see that in Mother Teresa. We Huge, certainly do. Big time. Okay, I'm going to be right back to teach God's Word. We're going to continue today on our teaching of the tongue. That's right. You can stick your tongue out to the person beside you and say, hey, listen, watch this. We need to watch a lot of times what we say. Someone has said you need to mind what you say or you say whatever comes to mind. And sometimes we blow it. Sometimes we're embarrassed. God's word has a lot to say about controlling our tongue. Yesterday, we referenced the whole teaching out of the book of James chapter 3 about a word to teachers. And we hold teachers up on a, on a pedestal to a degree, although right now teachers somewhat have a, a tarnished um, image that is hard to recover from because there's been so many letdowns. But 2,000 years ago when the scripture was written, James wrote and said, hey, you who are teachers, be careful what you say, because you're going to be actually held to a stricter judgment. And then he goes on to say that not only for a teacher, but for everyone, we have to watch our tongue. And he uses uh, a couple illustrations that you and I immediately gravitate to, even though it was 2,000 years ago. He said, we put bits into a horse's mouth and we steer them wherever they go. And uh, I know that, the little bit of horseback riding I've done, uh, you want to hold on to the, the reins because through the, uh, the bit and the bridle, you're going to steer the horse. And then having lived on both coasts in Canada, oftentimes I would see the big ships come in, whether on the Atlantic coast or the Pacific coast, always intrigued how that little rudder steers the boat. And James says, 
that that little rudder is a picture of the tongue. The bit is a picture of the tongue. Here's some questions that maybe we should ask ourselves today. I'm going to ask them to myself. And the question is, as we look at the, the analogy of the bridle to control the horse, does your tongue control you? Does your tongue obey you? Because control over our tongue is vital. Um, you know, many times we make slips, don't we? And we're very good at excuses. I know that I am. But sometimes the excuses uh, become like cold porridge sitting in the pot. What do they sound like? Well, we might say, oh, well, I don't do it too often. Or if we lose our cool, we say, well, uh, I'm not as bad as the other person. They're a lot worse than I am. And those excuses become hollow. Um, they become empty because oftentimes what we have said has caused so much pain. We think of the analogy of the ship and the rudder. Here's a question. Do you steer relationships with your tongue or does your, your tongue steer you? In other words, as I go into a situation, I, I can shoot my mouth off. It might be true what I'm saying, but the tone that I use, the way that I speak it, and trying to be sensitive to where the other person is, oftentimes can cause a blow up. Many times I've been learning. And uh, my wife has been a great teacher to me. She said, there's a time and a place for everything. A lot of times if we have to confront people, we need to say, hey, listen, I'd like to sit down and just talk to you about some things and do it in a controlled environment rather than storming into the room and shooting your mouth off. You can speak the truth in both situations, but one situation can be devastating while the other can bring healing and hope to the relationship. That's why I said yesterday that our tongue invites people to live or to die. What's yours doing? And you know, the, the, the idea of the rudder and the idea of the bit, they're small little things. And the tongue really is small. And it may not be that big, but does it boast a lot? Oftentimes, we're guilty of talking more about ourselves than of other things. James is going to go on in the passage, and he's saying that the tongue, even though it's small, it can be like a spark. You know what a spark is like when there's dry tinder? I've lived on the West Coast when there'd be many fires raging, and they were saying, don't throw a cigarette out. I remember one lady telling us that uh, a tire had blown on a trailer going by, and the spark from the rim hitting the road hit the grass fire and burnt eight homes. She was devastated. It had happened the day before, a couple days before, when we were driving through this park on the West Coast. It reminds me of what James says about the tongue. A little spark, and it can cause so much damage, so much hurt. And I want to invite you today to ask God for his grace, to soften your heart, to soften your tongue, so that you speak words that live, that give life and give hope. Just as Jesus invites all of us to follow him and let his spirit live through us, love through us, and speak through us. 